Hello, my name is Allison Warner, and I am the chief editor of Orthodontic Products. Today, we're launching a new weekly series in the sterilization room with Jackie. For over 20 years, Jackie Dorst has been a consultant specializing in instrument sterilization and infection control and prevention in the dental setting. She holds degrees in microbiology and dental hygiene and has been a featured speaker, speaker at the American Dental Association and the American Association of Orthodontists. Jackie and I both know that as you look ahead to the eventual reopening of your orthodontic practice, you are looking for the latest information and guidance on how to protect your team and patients when the doors reopen. So with that, we are launching this new series to talk about what you need to know to minimize exposure to COVID-19 and what you need to know to establish best practices in your office going forward. So let's get started. Jackie, thank you for joining me today. Allison, thank you for this opportunity to speak to all your readers and to the orthodontic profession. Everybody's looking for the recent information and how is it going to affect our practice and what do we do when we get back to work? Right. So let's talk about that first week and that first patient. What should the team prepare for? Um, first of all, um, right now we're all sort of sitting and waiting and looking at that April 30th date mm -hmm. and wondering, gee, are we going to be able to see patients on Monday, May the 3rd? Uh, is isolation going to be over or will it extend for another two weeks? And there has to be preparation that starts the week before they actually see that first person. So I would say, you know, anticipate uh, that April the 27th, that week you're going to start preparing. You're going to check out your equipment. Uh, I know Joseph Ross put together for orthodontic products a great uh, checklist of looking at the equipment in your office. So I would encourage all of your viewers to, to look at that checklist from his interview, from his written article with it. But um, they've got to look at all of their equipment. And then they've got to think about the patient schedule. How are you going to have that first patient? come into the office. Mm -hmm. And prior to that schedule, you've got to look at your physical facility and say, how many patients can we safely see in our open bay clinical area? And my thoughts are probably if the maximum is going to be about 20 patients a day. Mm -hmm. um, they may have been accustomed to seeing 60, 80, 100 patients a day prior to closure, but now we have to have the six feet social distance and consider the airborne transmission of this viral disease. So scheduling the patients, look at your physical facility. I know when I was with Dr. Tammy Meister, she had one room that was separate from all of the others. It was, had a wall between it. Uh, so my recommendation to her was, as you start seeing patients again, please schedule all procedures that require handpiece or maybe an air water syringe where there's going to be splattering and splashing of aerosol type fluids in that one separate room. And then she had, I think it was five chairs over in an open bay area. And I said, and you can probably schedule one other person over in that other area at the time. So basically she's two patients at a time. That's going to be the doctor and possibly two assistants. And then it would probably be good to have one more team member in the sterilization room. And that team member in between those two patients would be the one that would clean, disinfect, remove all of the um, orthodontic instruments, take those into the sterilization room, and then have that chair set up for the next person. That's going to preserve PPE because it will allow the orthodontic chairside assistant and the orthodontist to continue wearing their PPE. Mm. And that's one of the things that CDC has said with PPE shortages, we can look at what is called extended use or reuse of N95 respirators, of even the clinic gowns with it. It's gonna be part professional judgment about whether they do change their PPE, how frequently, depending on the procedure they did. How much aerosols did they create with that procedure? Um, it may just be that they take off their face shield, which they're wearing over their N95 respirator to preserve it, and they wash and disinfect that face shield, and then they're ready with hand sanitizing and new gloves to move and see the next patient with it. So prior to, your patients need to know what to expect too. 
this is all going to be new to them. And many of the patients have experienced at the grocery store and the drug store, the, the necessary places we've still had to go, that there's social distancing to the extreme where you go in one door of the building and you come out the other door. And I know even at my grocery store, they put up a splash shield mm -hmm. in front of the cash register. Right. Well, I, I talked with uh, Dr. Jay Bowman at Kalamazoo Orthodontics, and he's already fabricated acrylic shields that is sort of like a, a sneeze shield that goes around the front desk. He has two of those, one for each team member that would be at the front desk to sit behind. And of course, then he said they'll be wearing a mask and a level one mask would be adequate for them and gloves. Mm -hmm. So we're going to schedule our patients. We know how many patients we can see. And then I'd recommend doing a personal phone call. They've got the time now. In the past, we've done automatic uh, emails, text messages about your appointment, you know, confirm, and it's going to be a whole new world. No longer when the patient shows up, do they go up to a touch screen and touch and click in that they're there for their appointment and then go brush up and sit at the on deck area. It's a new greeting now. Yeah. So our patients do that phone call with them and say, we'd prefer to just have the patient in the office, mom or dad, whoever comes with them, if the patient cannot come by themselves, if you would not mind waiting in your car, that would be best for social distancing. And, you know, that's a concern for parents too. You, you may have a, a patient that their mom has lupus or has um, MS, is autoimmune compromised. They're much more comfortable in their car too. And I think doing that telephone call you're going to get a better sense of how the apprehension that the patients may have and coming back to our office. And it's a great opportunity to tell them, we're so excited to see you. <laughs> we're welcome. We've missed you. <laughs> and let them know, hey, we're welcoming you back. We, you know, we, we cannot hang out the welcome back banner, but in our heart, we're so happy to see you and make them feel that excited anticipation of getting back into uh, orthodontic treatment. So you've identified your priority patients. You know how many patients you can see with social distancing per day. Now you do your phone calls and your scheduling and let the patients know, hey, we're gonna be taking your temperature when you mm -hmm. first come in. So please don't drink anything hot or cold about 30 minutes prior because we want an accurate temperature reading. And it's going to be important to have that accurate temperature reading because we all know that if the temperature, if the patient has a temperature above 100.4, we shouldn't see them. Mm -hmm. They're probably infectious with something. And it's going to require to see that patient. It should only be an emergency type patient. Mm -hmm. If you can buy time and wait two weeks until they're non-infectious that 14 days, then you can treat them with normal coronavirus precautions. Right. So you have a system. Do, is there a particular phone number, maybe a cell phone, or that mom can text message or call and say, hi, I'm here. We're in the parking lot. And the greeter is there to meet Johnny at the door. Mm -hmm. And then you're talking about now when your child comes in for the appointment or when you as an adult patient come in for your appointment, the first thing we're going to do is take your temperature. Mm -hmm. This is going to be part of our wellness screening. So we want to take your temperature. So when you come in, we've got set a chair right beside the front door. Make it a vinyl chair or plastic chair, something that can be wiped down or disinfected. Mm -hmm. Beside that chair, you're going to need some sort of thermometers. I would recommend maybe a regular thermometer like this that has a plastic sheath over it that mm -hmm. is disposable. Or you can have the disposable paper thermometers like this that are next care. Now, in some of my previous seminars and webinars, I've actually shown the IR thermometer, the infrared thermometer that you've seen put on the forehead. Yeah. They are, they have a var variable inaccuracy of almost two degrees. Mm. Okay. You, you really have to get it almost right on the forehead mm. to be able to, and so you lose the, uh, the asepsis of it when you're doing that. So I would really go with, like I said, a traditional thermometer that is going to give you a very accurate temperature measurement with it. And you can buy a hundred of the plastic shields, even on Amazon, they're readily available now for a minimal cost. So mm -hmm. to me, rather than paying 60, 80, $90 for one of the infrareds, 
that is not as accurate, that's a much better solution. Okay. Ask your patients in your pre-screening to bring their own mask if they have a mask, or maybe you keep on this check table, this service area with your thermometers, some of the fabric mask. The fabric masks are readily available. They don't filter out, they don't, they, they only filter out like 3% of the microorganisms in the air. So they don't provide adequate protection from aerosols for the clinicians, but it does serve as a splash shield. And that's what we're looking for for the patient when they come in, that if they cough or sneeze, that their aerosols don't come out into the right. clinical area. So you've taken their temperature, it's okay. Go through the, the wellness check screening questions. Mm -hmm. um, have you had a cough? Um, have you had any difficulty breathing? You already know what their temperature. Have you been around anybody who has been diagnosed as having an infect COVID infection mm -hmm. with it? And then have you traveled or been in a contaminated area where there's a high risk? So mm -hmm. you've done that wellness screening with them. They have their mask on, now sanitize their hands. Off, offer them alcohol-based hand rubs because you don't know what they've touched prior to coming in. So they sanitize their hands. And then at that point, you're ready to escort them back to the clinical area. Okay. Now, there was a Chinese article published that pre-procedural mouth rinses could possibly reduce the viral load. Mm -hmm. And two of the, the products that the Chinese article recommended was um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, 1%, or um, a provodone iodine type reds with it. So peroxyl would be a very good, you know, there are a number of brand names produced by the, the different dental manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, be a pleasant mouthwash, uh, would not be harmful for, to the patient, is FDA proof, so you can have them swish, see if you can hold that for a minute and then spit it out, and then they put their mask back on because you want that patient wearing their mask the entire time that they come through. Now, the orthodontist and the assistant, they're all set up. They have the unit prepared, ready for the treatment of the patient, and they're in full PPE and the patient is seated. Then the greeter goes back to the front area and is ready to greet and triage the right. next patient, if you will. Okay. So at that point with treating the patient, now everything's set up. They're ready for the patient to remove their mask. And the ideal is that if we're gonna have to pick up a handpiece, if there's a bracket that needs to be repositioned, if we're doing a D-bond, uh, and they're probably gonna have to be a lot of brackets that are gonna have to be repositioned or, mm. or broken brackets right. that are gonna have to be, and that all requires a handpiece. So there needs to be one patient chair that has been segregated and to the best of their ability, depending on the, uh, the design of the office, that there's some sort of maybe aerosol barrier put up, mm -hmm. whether that's an acrylic screen or a a, even a plastic sheet or a shower curtain that right. is hung from a suspended ceiling. Uh, it's going to be a difficult accommodation, and it is not going to be an airborne disease isolation with mm -hmm. the configuration that we have in mo most of our orthodontic offices. So now they're they're set up, and they're prepared, and they're ready to treat the patient. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about treatment. What does that look like? Well, again, we're doing seeing one patient at a time. Traditionally, uh, the orthodontist came over, looked uh, at what needed to be treated on the patient, and then delegated that to the assistant. The assistant changed the arch wire, did whatever, and the orthodontist left. Now, because of all the PPE that's put on, let's I would say stay with that one patient. Then when they're ready to dismiss that patient, there needs to be an exit from the clinical area for the patient to either go out a separate hallway so that again, they're not encountering a, the second patient coming in that hallway, or maybe you even have them exit the back door. So mm -hmm. you, you need to have a greeter again, that it's gonna be that person that exits the patient out because I don't want the orthodontic assistant or the orthodontist to have to remove all of their PPE and go out to the car with the patient or go out to the front area to mom. Now, you know, you're gonna have some anxious moms too mm -hmm. or some anxious parents and yeah. you, or maybe one child that has special needs, let's mm -hmm. say, and mom does wanna come back. If mom comes back, in my way of thinking, mom needs to have that wellness screening also. 
Okay. Take the temperatures, where's the mask, and then have them, and then that's gonna limit how many other patients you can have in the treatment bay area because now you have mom sitting there. So it is, it's definitely gonna be an exception. I talked uh, with Joyce Matlack, one of our premier orthodontic office designers yesterday. And she mm -hmm. said, well, I have doctors who are looking at setting up their treatment coordinator's room because very often that's a room with a door that you can close. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but Joyce, they don't have uh, air. They don't have a handpiece in there. They don't have air water. They just have a chair, a very often a patient chair. And she said, yeah, well, you can buy these mobile units but that's about $10,000 for it. Um, now it may be an option for doing an aligner delivery or mm -hmm. something that doesn't require a handpiece or an air water syringe um, yeah. with it. So that's, and, and <clears throat> looking at all of this PPE, Allison, mm -hmm. the office needs to know that they have adequate supplies to get right. through a patient day. Because now just the scenario that we've gone through with you and I, with this new patient coming in, there's gonna be a level one mask used by the front desk person. Mm -hmm. And then there's gonna be a level one or level two mask used by the meter greeter person. So those are two masks with it. And I would have the meter greeter wear some sort of clinical covering too. Maybe it's not an isolation gown, one of those tie back gowns. Maybe it's a right. clinic jacket. You know, okay. the front desk could well wear a, a clinic jacket of some sort um, because mm -hmm. they're not going to be exposed to any splatters or splashes. Mm -hmm. But again, that's the visual reassurance to patients of what we're doing. So those are, that's two masks and two jackets that you need. Now the orthodontist and the orthodontic assistant are going to need an N95 respirator, a full face shield, a gown, and gloves. So that's times two for each patient, for the doctor and for the assistant. Right. If they don't have N95 respirators, then they'll use the highest level of surgical mask that they have, the pleated mask with it, mm -hmm. with the full face shield in there. So they need, let's say for calculation purposes, they're seeing 20 patients a day. Well, that's 40 sets of the, all of that PPE. Okay. So that gives them a calculation. And I think they're just, we're orthodontic offices to get in all of this backlog of patients that we need to, that we're not just going to work an eight hour day. Maybe you schedule patients for 10 hours a day mm. and you know, you have an extended hours and you're working five days a week or maybe even some Saturdays. Right. And maybe you divide the team into team A and team B and you have team B work the morning shift of six hours and a team B works the afternoon sit shift or alternate days hmm. in between there because it, it, we're gonna have to find out what works for your team and for your physical facility. The physical, we, we've gotta make accommodations because of the limitations with the physical facility in there. So CDC put together for PPE what they called a burn rate calculator. Mm -hmm. And it's an Excel spreadsheet that gives them a calculation of just how many masks, how many gowns are they gonna need for that first week. Now we've talked, I talked to say maybe 20 patients a day for the first week. Then as you get the system down and the engine starts going, remember the little engine? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Well, as you're going uphill on it, next week you can schedule a few more patients. Mm. And maybe you've got a few more of those barriers in. And then you go to week three. And how are we fine tuning here? And you know what what can we do that? And with the uh, guidance that we're getting from CDC, you know how how is the the curve flattening? Are the infections going lower? What what guidance are we going to get from CDC? Again, about scheduling patients and the precautions that we need to be taking at this time. As a microbiologist, I'm real optimistic. Uh, yeah, we're, it's going to be a new world. It's yeah. it's not going to be pre-closure world, mm -hmm. but I'm real optimistic that we will, the medical community will have treatments that will lessen the, the, the severity of mm -hmm. a COVID-19 infection. I'm real hopeful that patients will, who have a, that mild infection, those 80% of the patients will have acquired immunity. Mm -hmm. 
Right now, we know that they have antibodies. The medical scientific community doesn't know how long those antibodies last. Right. If the antibodies continue, then it could provide them protection from it. And then as we get a vaccine in the future, then 12 months down the road, we, we can get back to a more normal schedule, but it, there's still going to be that heightened awareness. Yeah. Uh, we're going to need to be able to reassure our patients how safe they are when they come to the practice and to let the team know. How yeah. safe are they going to be to give them the reassurance that we are taking the correct protective measures against this uh, enveloped virus that is a 0.125 micron size particle that can survive in plastics and stainless steel for up to 72 hours. So, and, and with it being an, an, an aerosol droplet transmission, right now we know that it survives on those surfaces. But that's just a, a laboratory survival. We don't know if it if it's capable of transmitting the disease. Okay. And I use the we from the scientific and the medical community. The probability of it being able to transmit a disease is very low from a, from a surface at that time mm -hmm. because viruses can't they can't multiply on their own. They have to be inside of a living cell to multiply. Unlike okay. bacteria, bacteria a staph or a strep bacteria can survive mm -hmm. on a surface on its own and it can multiply on its own. It mm -hmm. has a full nucleus that it's capable of reproducing uh, as long as it's in a nice warm, wet environment. Mm -hmm. Viruses can't, they have to use the mechanism of the living cell and they like the mechanism from the oral pharynx area to the lining of the lungs and in the alveoli of the lungs. That's their favorite area to replicate. So lots more information coming and I'm optimistic yeah. that we will be, learn how can we safely, you know, each, each week I learn new information about how we can safely work in the office. Right. So we've gotten the patient in, we've treated them, we found mm -hmm. a way for them to exit uh, and not run into another patient. <laughs> we've maintained our isolation with it. Um, and so now they, the instruments go into the sterilization room. You have a dedicated team member that's there that is cleaning those instruments and has the setup for the next treatment prepared. The unit has been disinfected. Everyone needs to review their standard precautions. Well, mm -hmm. you and I, when we talked last week, I held up the CDC book and, and said, right. hey, if you're, if you're not current on it, go through the CDC dental check app and make sure that you can check yes for every item on there from PPE to hand hygiene to instrument sterilization to how you use your disinfectants. Mm -hmm. They need to know how long does their disinfectant need to stay wet on a surface, right. mm -hmm. you know, and if their disinfectant is on that EPA approved. And I know uh, Orthodontic Products has saved that our um, our webinar, our um, interview from last week and lots of good information in there. And again, you know, we're, we're going to be sharing more information with them with each sterilization check. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the reality of starting up again is it's going to be a, it's going to be disruptive to the usual workflow. So realistically, it sounds like a team needs to practice first. Oh, you're so right. <laughs> we don't want to have that patient come in the front door and go, oh, I forgot to get the thermometer. Right. Oh, 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 you need to see that. What are the tissues? Oh, alcohol. Who's got the alcohol hand sanitizer? Uh, oh, did, yeah. oh, you left. Uh, we only have one bottle. <laughs> So yes, we do need to practice um, that week before where you're starting up all the equipment and you're, you're refilling your sterilizers with distilled water. And that's another thing. Oh, let me just go down the bunny trail here. Okay. They need to be acquiring now the instructions for back to work for each piece of equipment from their manufacturer. Okay. I know I was able to get from like Sycan with the statums. A lot of people have a statum autoclave in there. They put out a great one page, two page. This is what you need to do uh, after your sterilizer has been shut down for two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. So startup instructions for all of their equipment. I even had one from 3M on their cure lights. You know, uh, a lot of them are battery charged. Um, you're going to need to check your, um, the power of your cure light, check the lights on it, uh, disinfect that surface, make sure that it's properly charged up and ready for curing the adhesives on it. So 
Yeah, there, there's a lot and they do need to practice and be prepared. There is nothing that is going to give the confidence and the reassurance rather than walking through it. And I would encourage the doctor and the assistant to get their full PPE on mm -hmm. and then have the greeter person that is going to be the greeter and doing the wellness screening with them to get all ready, get their supplies out. And maybe you get the doctor's child to come in or the spouse, the doctor's spouse, somebody to come in and be patient. Right. And actually have them call that dedicated phone number to say, hi, we're here in the parking lot. Uh, fine. Jackie will be out to meet you at the door. Or if it's a young child, oh, I understand. Johnny's only eight years old. I'm going to walk out to the car and walk him in just to be sure with that. Or, you know, and, and then do the practice, have the patient sit down. Did you bring your own mask? Uh, don't forget to get it out of the car. That's another reminder with it. They come in, sit down, take their temperature. Oh, look at that, 98.6. You're doing good. Did you have anything hot or cold to drink in the last 30 minutes? Fine. This is an accurate reading. Go through the rest of your triage questions. They've got their mask back on, sanitizer. So physically do each of that and then walk that team member back to the chair and sit them in the chair. And I would love to, for it to be a non, um, that the patient to be a non-orthodontic assistant, mm -hmm. not somebody who's knowledgeable, who goes, oh, okay, I go in and sit down here, but somebody who goes, well, where do I go now? Or mm -hmm. okay. why do I need to do that? That would ask questions. So practice session, yes. That's what's gonna make our patients feel confident and trust us when they come back into the office. Yeah, okay. Well, there's a lot of news going on and there's a lot of information that's floating around yes. and topics on forums and you know everywhere. But I've been hearing a lot about uh, air filtration rooms this week. Is this something that orthodont practices should be thinking about? Allison, it's a consideration. The quality of the air and we all have seen the, uh, the videos on YouTube, I even put one on my Facebook and LinkedIn page that showed, um, it was a Japanese video that showed the viral particles and from a cough or sneeze and how far they could go and how long they stayed suspended in the area. I know uh, Dr. Jay Bowman with Kalamazoo Orthodontics, he brought it to my attention first and, and Dr. Bowman's a great researcher. He gets all of the information and he looks at it from several different angles and asks great questions. And he said, Jackie, I'm considering putting in a negative pressure uh, room with a HEPA filter in my office. What do you think about it? And so that's an area that I have not, didn't have a lot of expertise. So I had to start doing my research on it. Mm -hmm. There is, an, and we do need to look at the air quality in our offices. When you uh, go into hospitals and to surgical centers, they have what is called an ANSI AMI standard, and it looks like at the air quality in a healthcare facility. And the air exchanges in the air, air um, in the facility, like with the HVAC, with your heating and your air conditioning system, for a medical facility, like for a patient room, um, should be at least six air exchanges per hour. That means that all of the air in that room is changed out six times every hour. Mm -hmm. Ideally, if it's a where you do surgical type procedures or aerosol procedures like we do in an orthodontic office, mm -hmm. then it should be 12 air exchanges per hour but at a minimum, six air exchanges. So I think that's where the orthodontist needs to start looking at air quality right now. Not at buying one of these three to $10,000 separate air purification units that says that it does six air exchanges per hour in a room that's 10 by 10 with an eight foot ceiling, because that's certainly not what an ortho office is. Right it would probably take 10 to 20 of those units mm. to filter all of the air. And my concern is purchasing or investing in a piece of equipment that doesn't deliver what maybe the marketing brochure says. Mm. 
It's much more complex than just buying a air purifier that says it has a HEPA filter. They have to look at what, how much airflow goes through that. That's part of what gives you the air exchanges per hour. And then how often does that HEPA filter need to be changed? One unit that I looked at, it had a HEPA filter in it, but it was gonna need to be changed every like 200 or 400 hours of operation and the filters were $160 a piece. Oh, wow. So that could add a, be a significant cost in overhead to the office. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation to orthodontists during this closure time is get an, ex, an expert HVAC person, a knowledgeable person, someone who belongs to ASHRAE. That's the association, A-S-H-R-A-E. It's the Association for Heating and Air Conditioning People. And you want someone who is knowledgeable about healthcare air to come in and measure how many air exchanges per hour does your current system do? Mm. Can you put a HEPA filter in and replace just the air filter that you have now on your unit? And can they evaluate the health of your air? I'm not gonna say the cleanliness of it, but the health of your air. So that would be a good place to start is to, to have that evaluation done by somebody. It may be that the heating and air conditioning system is an older unit and it needs a more powerful motor in it mm. to increase. So again, I'm, I'm drilling down and learning more about this. And with the help of the doctors who are investigating this also, like Dr. Bowman, mm -hmm. and we, the AAO even has a task force. Uh, a COVID-19 task force that they've asked me to participate in. So we have a lot of experts coming together with different information on this. Right now, I would, uh, my recommendation is re really investigate thoroughly any equipment invest investments that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, don't spend your money wisely. Um, I can't test the air to say, hey, this is how many CFUs there are in a cubic foot of your air in your office. I can test your sterilizer. I can do a spore test and mm -hmm. say, yes, it works. Mm -hmm. I can check your ultrasonic cleaner with aluminum foil for sonication and say, yes, it's doing. I can test the water with a water test to say, yes, your water is under 500 CFU. You can spend $3,000 on an air purification system. I can't test it. Yeah. I don't know what kind, and my, what I have learned is if there's not a way to exhaust the air that goes through that air purification, it may be just dumping poor quality air back into the office. Uh. So again, there needs to be some in-depth research. There's a lot of, um, of innovative ideas that are coming out. Everything from UV uh, irradiation uh, in addition to the HEPA filter as it goes through these purification units. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, a one suction unit that, uh, and that one of the things that CDC recommends to control aerosols is using uh, high-speed evacuation, an mm -hmm. HVE uh, with it. Well, there's a suction cup that expands almost like a reverse funnel mm -hmm. that goes on the HVE tip. So if it's next to the patient's mouth, it's taking more of those aerosols away. Uh, I found one unit um, that one of the orthodontists sent me a copy of, and he says, what do you think about this, Jackie? And it looked almost like a, a, a mini refrigerator mm -hmm. with a crane arm that came across it and then came down with one of those suction cups that goes over the patient. And then I looked down at how noisy is it? And you can't move air without it being noisy. Yeah. So imagine having this industrial type fan going <laughs> in your office and trying to calm an anxious patient. It's a, it really is. Ideally, um, I, I, I would love to have an expert advise me. And, and we're looking at that among uh, a group of infection preventionists that I belong to so right now. Check your current HVAC system. How many air exchanges per hour does it provide? Put in a HEPA filter with it and maybe look at one of those cups that goes on your HVE that you could use in addition to the saliva ejector when you are doing um, aerosol procedures. And I think that would be a good adjunct. Many of these things that we talk about, they're additional or adjunct right. to basic standard precautions. Standard precautions protects the team. So that's why I'm urging everybody to do the dental check, the CDC dental check. 
-hmm. and make certain they can check yes on each one of those. So lots of new information coming out. Don't get overwhelmed and don't jump out there and spend money without thorough investigation. Right. Another issue that's all over the place is the reuse of N95 masks and sterilization of these masks. What are your thoughts there or what are you hearing? You're right. There's a lot of information in chat rooms and social media. And uh, wow, even from what CDC has put out, I have spent hours going through documents to interpret it. The current guidance from CDC uh, on N95 respirators, if you have one, is that you can wear it for extended use, meaning use it, wear the same mask throughout the morning, throughout the afternoon. Ideally, the recommendation is one patient, one mask, but we're not in the ideal world now. So it is cri- it's what's called crisis management for PPE shortages. And then there is reuse. So you have an N95 mask, uh, respirator mask, and refer to them, I would suggest that everybody refer to them as respirator mask because we've commonly referred to as a mask, as a surgical mask. That's the one that's pleated, that has the gaps around the side of it. So Mm -hmm. we need to refer to that as an N95 respirator mask to Mm -hmm. distinguish between the two of them. Uh, You can reuse those. Um, CDC says, yes, it's appropriate. Be careful about how you remove it because the outside of it could be contaminated. So you want to wear your gloves. Normally you wouldn't wear gloves. You wear your gloves with it. And then you want to place it on a breathable type of container or surface. You don't want to close it up in a plastic bag because then if it has bacteria growing in it, staph or strep bacteria loves the warm wet and Mm -hmm. it will multiply but putting it on a piece of pa- a paper with a paper towel over the top of it or putting it in a paper bag, then that's a, a breathable type. So you're not confining the other microorganisms and encouraging their replication and growth with it. Um, there are a number of, with the shortage, there's been a lot of talk about sterilizing these masks. Yeah. And you can imagine a thick mask that has all of the different layers to filter out. How do you get any sterilizing agent deep into those layers to kill not only the virus, but the bacteria um, that could be lodged in there? And if they're improperly stored, you could even have fungus, candida, that could be replicating inside the layers of the mask. So CDC, the FDA, I should say, gave an approval last week to a company that makes these large institutional sterilizers um, that can re-sterilize N95 respirators. Well, you have to identify them with which person does it belong to? Because Mm -hmm. I obviously would not want to be wearing your mask, Allison, and I know you wouldn't want to be wearing my mask because Mm -hmm. they're not washed in between. We're only trying to kill the germs in them. Mm. So they can be put, these are not regular autoclaves that they're going in. They're using like vaporized hydrogen peroxide, maybe a 6%. And it is, it's a commercial, it's a institutional, a commercial unit that we're not going to have available to us in orthodontic right. offices. Yeah. Um, there's also been an uh, investigation in looking into UV radiation. The concern is that if you're using UV light, it doesn't get down into the areas that are shadowed Mm. deeper in the layers. So there could still be viable microorganisms. I saw one recommendation from CDC in their guidance that if you work five days a week, that looking at issuing five N95 respirators, and one would be for Monday, one Tuesday, one Wednesday, so that you had at least 72 hours in between use of each one of those respirators. And then they were stored in that paper bag or in a clean area. So remember we said 72 hours was the maximum time that it's been documented the virus can survive on a plastic or stainless Mm -hmm. steel surface. It starts to die within hours on paper or cardboard. So the theory is, hey, you know, it would sort of air out and self sanitize, if you will. Mm-hmm. in between not the ideal and i would even in, i would even recommend to the team that they go right now and buy some command hooks 
you know those 3M hooks that you oh, can yeah. put on the wall and they mm -hmm. peel off? Well, I would put those 3M hooks on the wall, either in the staff lounge or down the hallway, and everybody, when they take off their gown, they can hang it up on their hook and they can hang their N95 respirator and their shield on that same hook. And that what gives them a way that if they are going to reuse them, that they could store them in a clean manner with it. Mm -hmm. So right now, effectively sterilizing mask um, with the FDA guidance and the CDC guidance, I don't see that as an option for N95 respirator mask uh, in, in the orthodontic office at this time. Um, you know, it, it could change next week because we're right. constantly getting new information in. Uh, so again, go to Trustworthy. Every one of the members who's listening to this, please use the CDC guidance with it, um, the OSHA guidance. If you haven't downloaded uh, OSHA for guidance for uh, COVID-19, please download it. There's specific information in there about respirator protection, N95 protection, and the oral health profession. Orthodontics are lumped in there with dentists and oral surgeons and periodontists. We all come under the same guidance with it, um, but specific information, and we're considered high risk because of the aerosols that we ger generate. And whenever you're reading that guidance, go down to um, the precautions to use with aerosol generating procedures. And CDC published this last week specific dental guidance for um, during the COVID-19. I think I, I sent you the link to that. Yeah. And after you went down through all of the options of extended use for PPE, reuse of PPE, in bold print, CDC stated, if you don't have adequate PPE, don't treat the patient with an aerosol procedure. Mm -hmm. Refer them to another facility that does have the PPE or does have the right facility. Yeah. Well, I think this is great information for our viewers and we will keep track of what is going on to bring you the latest info on these issues. Jackie, thank you so much. Keep calm be safe and investigate all of this. There is light coming for us. Oh my gosh, if we can start seeing patients again on May 3rd, oh, we are gonna be dancing down the uh, uh, aisles in the ortho office. So it is gonna get better. Um, mm. Get prepared, talk with your team, discuss all the ins and outs like Allison and I talked about it today, and you'll have a plan and be confident that you're providing safe orthodontic care to each one of those patients. And and getting their beautiful smiles straight. Great. And with that, we will be back next week for another for our next episode of In the Sterilization Room with Jackie Dorst and, and help you get back to work. In the meantime, be sure to keep up on the latest orthodontic industry news at orthodonticproductsonline.com. Until next time, take care and be safe. Thank you.